Morning everyone. Morning. Uh, here again. We're talking about uh, this little series uh, about meeting Jesus. And who met with Jesus last week? Who was it? Nathaniel. Just want to make sure you're listening. And this week we're going to look at the meeting between Jesus and the royal official. And next week as we conclude this short series we're going to look at the meeting that Jesus had with the paralysed man. I stress the phrase the scripture used there, royal official. Because it's a bit of a royal week, isn't it? What with Her Majesty uh, celebrating her reign uh, for so many years. So I thought it was a nice thing to maybe have that, uh, that phrase there, royal official. I was going to share another meeting that Jesus had, but I thought, no, we'll, go, we'll use this one because that word royal. I don't just throw these things together, you know. I know it looks like I do, but I don't. But also... Our chairman this morning, a very, very great friend of mine, Andrew, and of course he's a, quite royal in his own way, you know. And I don't mean Royal Dalton. <laughs> Indeed not. Andrew is not sanitary wear. But I think, I'm sure I'm right in thinking that Andrew belongs to a royal college. Yes, yes indeed he does. Being the, uh, the highly experienced and expert consultant he is, Andrew's a member of a royal college. And one of the, the greatest things in my professional life is that I'm also a member of a royal institution. I know you all thought I should be the member of an institution. Well, now you've been proved right, because I am. Because I am a fellow of the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors. And that's one of the highlights of my professional life, if not the only one, to be honest. But there we are. But I thought we'd... Thank you. I'm also a member of the Royal Priesthood. Thank you, Lisa, for that. I never thought of that. So, a bit of a royal feeling this morning, particularly when we look at this, this royal official. We're not, he's not named, he's just called this royal official who came to Jesus. Now this guy lived in a few miles away, probably 15, 17 miles away, near Lake Galilee in Capernaum. But his son was not well, in fact his son was near to death. And he'd heard that Jesus was coming to Cana. So he thought, right, I'm going to go there and see what this man can do for me. This royal official, now the word there used for this royal official means he was part of a court, he was uh, one of the courtiers of the king. He was a nobleman, he was in the service of a king and it's more than likely, in fact it's quite probable, the king he was in service to will have been Herod Antipas, one of the Herods who took over after Herod the Great had died. Because Herod Antipas was the key, the tetrarch or whatever ruler uh, looking after Galilee. And of course, this man was in Galilee. He lived in Galilee, Capernaum. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty fair assumption that he was actually in the service of King Herod Antipas. And that's why he's referred to as a royal official. He's not just a common garden official, common garden official. This guy is a royal official in the service of a king. And he's at Capernaum, on Lake Galilee. That was a border town. They had a garrison there. That customs post there because it was on the border. So he may well have been involved in those sort of things on behalf of of his king and that's what he was there to do he was obviously quite well off because we read later on that as he headed back home his servants came to him to give him the news about his son so obviously he had a large household himself he had servants he was obviously a father that goes without saying because of course we know the whole story is about the fact he comes to Jesus because his son is not well was he Jewish? that we don't know When Jesus speaks to him and the crowd and he refers to you people wanting wonders and signs, that you there is a plural. It may include the man. It it certainly includes all the crowd. And of course they were Jewish. So was he Jewish? We don't really know. He may, he may not have been. More interestingly, I'm sure some of you Bible scholars will tell me that there are a couple of men actually mentioned in the scriptures who actually we know were associated directly with Herod Antipas. There's a guy called Chuzza, C-H-U-Z-A, who's referred to in Luke. And he's referred to as the steward of Herod. And his wife, Joanna, actually becomes a believer of Jesus. And works with Jesus, goes around with him, supports Jesus in his ministry. So who knows, could it be Chuzza? That after what happened here, he and his wife, because they told all his household was saved. Were they the family talking of here? We don't know. But also in Acts, there's also a gentleman in Acts called Menaean who's referred to as someone who was actually brought up with Herod when he grew up and stayed with him as a man. Could he be the royal official we're talking about? And that's why he's referred to in Acts later on, because he became a leader. We don't know. It's nice to conjecture about these things, but let's not be hard and fast about it. We don't know. What we do know is, we have here a royal official. A man with status, a man with money. 
A man who lived about 15, 17 miles away from Cana. He lived in a place called Capernaum. A man who was a father. And that took precedence now because his son was ill. His son was near death. And this man was desperate to do something for his son. So what did he do? In verse 47 we see there that he came to Jesus. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judah, he went to him. He came to Jesus. He travelled all those miles. Don't forget in those days these weren't good roads, they were difficult roads, bandits, all the rest of it. But he decided he's got to get there. Now we know he got there about one o'clock in the afternoon because later on it refers to the fact that Jesus spoke around about the seventh hour, which is about one o'clock in the afternoon. So if you work it back, three miles an hour, so I'm told, is what we can normally work on a, on a, on a fair surface. So he must have left home about five or six hours before one o'clock. So the early hours of the morning he gets up and he travels those miles in the heat of the morning to get to see Jesus, to come to where Jesus was in Cana of Galilee. Why? Well, he would already heard about what Jesus had been doing. Just three or four chapters into the Gospel now, the Lord had been doing so many amazing things already that word had spread about, about this man who was doing these great things. And more than likely, this official had heard John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus. Why do I say that? Well, don't forget, John the Baptist and Herod Antipas were not friends. John the Baptist actually criticised Herod for his lifestyle. And I'm sure Herod would discuss this with his officials to say, what are we going to do about this man? This man who's saying these things about me, but also saying things about Jesus, being the saviour of the world, being the Lamb of God, the one who said he was, the, he was greater than me. Because actually told in Matthew 14, if you look at it, that Herod discussed John the Baptist with his officials. Could well have been this guy. So we knew about Jesus through his discussions there. He went to Cana when he got there, but probably he'd already heard it. Capernaum wasn't that far away from Cana. He'd heard what Jesus had done some weeks before, some days before, when he actually turned water into wine. I'm sure he would have heard what Jesus did in John 2 when he cleared the temple. No one in the country there could have avoided that, that news. That sort of news would have travelled quite quickly around to say that this man, this rabbi, this teacher from Galilee had gone to Jerusalem and cleared the temple of all the money changers. And it tells us that Jesus was doing miraculous things as he was going about in his ministry. This man obviously had heard about these things. He looked at the situation he found himself in with his son near death's door. And he decided, there's a man that I've got to go to. So he came to Jesus. The problem is, coming to Jesus is not enough. It's just not enough, as this man, this official, found out. And the difficulty is that people in this world do think that that's enough. I can come to Jesus in the sense that, well, I know about him. I can consider him. I can accept him possibly as a historical figure. I can follow the example of his life. I can consider him as a a good man. And many, many people in the world, indeed in our churches... Come to Jesus because they've heard about him and what he's done and what he can do. And they consider him. But I'm here to tell you this morning, based on what we read in scripture here, that coming to Jesus is not enough. But more than that, if you go now from verses 47 through the verses 50, the man here interacted with Jesus. He found Jesus where he was in Cain at the time. And he actually says here, he begged him to come down to see his son and to heal his son. The fact that a royal royal official now took second place. He wasn't fussed now about his reputation or his status. His son was dying. And being a father was more important to him than being a royal official. And so he begged Jesus to come down to Capernaum and to heal his son. And Jesus spoke to him and also to those round and about. What did Jesus say when this man begged him? Jesus said this. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Jesus was speaking to the man but also to the crowd round about. As I said earlier on, that you and that you people is in the plural. 
And what Jesus is saying there is, the pe- these people, the, 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 their, their mindset is such that all they want to see is signs and wonders. They want to see signs, things that are attractive to their understanding, that appeal to what they understand. They want to see wonders, things they've never seen before. They want to be amazed, things that appeal to their imagination. But Jesus is trying to get a point across, that's not enough. That sort of interaction with God is not enough. Wanting these things all the time. He's trying to say to this man and to the crowd round and about, that's not enough. But at least the man listened to Jesus' words. He didn't come to Jesus and beg, thought Jesus was criticising him and thought, I've got no chance and go off. No, he stayed and he begged again. His interaction with Jesus carried on. Because his concern for his son, the fact that his son was at death's door, was so much that he carried on. And even though he may not have fully understood those words at that time, he didn't take them to mean that he should go away. His interaction carried on. He listened to what Jesus said. And he begged him again. And then what happened when he begged him the second time around? Sir, he says, come down before my child dies. Now that word sir can be translated as Lord, but not on this occasion. The word used here for sir is not the word that can be used for Lord and can refer to God as Jehovah or to God as Elohim. That's not the way the word is used here. The man uses it here as a term of respect. It's a customary term, the way he uses it. How you would call a father even, how you would call a teacher, how you would call a master, someone who owns something. You use it as a term of respect. And here the man was interacting with Jesus in that way, giving him respect that Jesus deserved, but not accepting who Jesus fully was. He didn't call him Lord. He called him Sir. Yes, he was shown respect in that, in, in that, in, in that way. It's not a bad thing. But it wasn't enough in his interaction. He just called him Sir. He didn't realise fully who Jesus was, even though he was interacting with Jesus he said to him sir come down before my child dies another thing there he believed quite possibly that this man this great teacher this Jesus if he came to his house saw his son touched his son was in the presence of his son could heal his son what he didn't believe or what he didn't consider or what he didn't think was that Jesus could do it anytime any place anywhere Yes, he was a healer. He'd heard he was a healer. Yes, he could do miraculous signs. Yes, he seemed to have authority from God to do certain things. But he's still not God. He's just only Sir. So he's got to be in the room with my son to heal him. Come down. Come back with me to Capernaum. Travel those five or six hours with me. Just so you can take pity on me and my family and my son and heal my son. He was interacting and that's good in that way. But it wasn't enough. Heal my son. The man knew Jesus was a healer. And that's what he wanted. And you can blame him for that. What father wouldn't want their son to be healed? But again, that's all he thought Jesus was. A healer. Someone maybe blessed of God. Gifted of God. Who can heal. But no more than that. And what did Jesus say to him? You. Well, actually my version just says go. Another version says you may go. Jesus replied. Your son will live now that's interesting to use that phrase you may go or go as it says there why is that interesting it's interesting because that is a sort of standard phrase the customary phrase that was used by a judge at the end of a court case when you went to court in those days you bring your case to the judge you make an appeal to the judge and when he considered things and he'd made his decision he would simply say you may go And then the person making the appeal would understand that's the end of the case. The decision has been made. Now he was a royal official. He understood how these things worked in these legal situations, in the law. And he knew when he heard those words that that was the end to it. That Jesus had made his decision. Thankfully, his decision was, your son will live. And he accepted that. So he accepted the authority that he heard in Jesus' words. The interaction he had with him, he accepted that. And he went and he left. But perhaps also, it's interesting. This man, as I've referred to quite often, is a royal official. He's used to dealing with a king. 
of sorts. Herod Antipas, who wasn't the, the greatest of kings by any means in what he did. And in fact, this man, Jesus refers to as a fox. He's also a sly man, a deceitful man in, the, in, in his dealings with people. And we know the, the famous story about his interaction with John the Baptist and how we had John the Baptist beheaded because of his uh, wrong marriage at that time to uh, another relative. He was a fox. He disregarded Jesus. Herod Antipas actually met Jesus later on at his trial. When Pilate realised that Jesus was a Galilean, and Herod Antipas, who was the ruler of Galilee, was in Jerusalem, so that's an idea, I'll send him to Herod Antipas, let him sort it out. I'll avoid the issue, the hassle. So Herod Antipas actually met Jesus, hoping he might see a sign and a wonder. It didn't happen, because Jesus stood before him, silent, and said nothing. And because of that, Herod Antipas just disregarded him, said, look, that. Not for me. It doesn't work for me. You're not doing what I want you to do. And he disregarded Jesus. The point I'm trying to make is that this official, this royal official, was used to dealing with that king. He was used to the authority of a king. When that king spoke, he and others would carry out his words, would carry out his instructions. He heard Jesus say to him, You may go. Your son will live. And in those five words... He heard, he understood, he felt the authority. He was used to authority being given to him in words. And when Jesus spoke those words, he recognised the authority he was hearing. And so he went. And that in itself is a good thing because he recognised Jesus had that authority. He recognised that Jesus had made a decision and he no doubt was thankful that the decision was his son would live. But he didn't carry on. He accepted what he heard from the authority of the words given, and he went. You see, it's good that the royal official came to Jesus, but it's not enough. It's good that the royal official interacted with Jesus. He spoke to him. He listened to him. He suspected the words that he was given. It's good that he interacted with Jesus, but it's not enough. It's not enough. And again, the problem is, people come to Jesus and think it's enough. People even interact with Jesus, if you will, and they think it's enough. I read my Bible. I go to all the meetings. I go to extra meetings over and above what I'm supposed to go. I support the Lord's work in many places. I can say the right words, you know. When I'm in the, with God's people in the fellowship, you know what? I know what to say. I know not what to say. I can do the right things. You see, you're interacting. We're interacting. Other people are interacting with Jesus. And the danger is, I, you, we, they all think that's enough. It is not enough. Coming to Jesus is not enough, as this official found. Interacting with Jesus is not enough. What is enough? I will tell you what is enough, or indeed... The scripture will tell you what is enough. In verse 53, he realised it was the exact time Jesus spoke. So he and his whole household believed. Now that's enough. Not just coming to Jesus, not even interacting with Jesus as this man did. You have got to believe in Jesus. Yeah? That's what's enough. You see, he heard the words. He went back to Capernaum. He travelled for some hours, five or six hours possibly for quite some time. As he neared home, probably enjoying nightfall, what well, it must have been during nightfall, his servants met him to say, look, your son's been healed. He's well. He's no longer at death's door. I say it must have been at nightfall. Why do I say that? Well, because the servants say, when he tell them what time it was, it refers to that 1pm being at yesterday. The Jewish day went from sun, started at sunset and went round to sunset. So obviously, when he got home, it was after sunset. Therefore, what had happened some hours before was in the previous day. It was yesterday. So he arrives home at nightfall. And when he finds out, it's exactly the same time, the seventh hour at 1pm, that his son's fever broke and he came back from death's door. He remembered, he realised, that's the exact moment when Jesus spoke to him. It's wonderful in verse 53. It doesn't refer to 
the royal official realised that this was the exact time. It says, the father realised. The father realised. I love that because he's not an official, he's a father concerned for his son. A son who was at death's door who was going to die. And this father realised the exact moment Jesus spoke, his son was healed and his son will now live. And that made him believe in Jesus. Something happened in his life. A major change happened in his life. God, Jesus, did something in his life that he knew couldn't have happened without Jesus. And that's when he believed. He realised his son would live. At the, when, when he realised that that was the exact time his son would live at one o'clock. Now why is that one o'clock interesting? You know and I know that I love these things in scripture about numbers. And when I see something like that, I want to know why was it at one o'clock that Jesus spoke those words and why was it at one o'clock that the son was healed? The only thing I can come up with is this. At one o'clock in the afternoon on Good Friday, Jesus was in the middle of paying the price for all our sins and giving us life. Because it says in the scripture that from the third hour to the sixth hour, which is six, sorry, from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, which is 12 noon to three o'clock, darkness came on the earth, and that's when Jesus paid the price for our sin. And at one o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus was paying the price for our sin. Jesus was bringing us from death to life. Jesus was healing us. And to me, that speaks to the same thing here. The man realised at one o'clock in the afternoon, his son had been healed. He'd come from death to life. And so symbolically, he too now, by believing, has come from death to life. Why? Because believing is enough. Lovely little word, that believing. The word John uses in, belief, in his scripture. I don't get too technical, but John uses a specific Greek word. Pisteo. And what does it mean? What it means is you're persuaded of. If you believe in something, you're persuaded by what you believe in. You put your confidence in it. You believe it so much, you put your confidence in it. You put your trust in that person. You believe in that person, so you trust them. You rely on them. You commit to them. If you believe in a person, that's what it means. You're persuaded they are who they say they are. You put your confidence in, you trust, you rely, you commit to them. That's what believing in a person means. And that's what believing in Jesus means. And John loves this word. Why do I say that? Well, in Matthew, this word is only used ten times. In Mark, a mere nine times. In Luke, again, he uses this word ten times. John uses it 99 times. John loves this word. John loves this word to believe in Jesus. And how do I know that? Well, you know how I know that. Because of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The most well-known verse of scripture, many would agree. John loves the word. If you go to the Gospel of John, you see what it means to believe in Jesus. If you believe in him, you get eternal life. You've got to believe, John says, he's the Christ. You've got to believe, John says, he's the Messiah. That's in John 20. You've got to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You've got to believe that Jesus is from God. You've got to believe that Jesus has been sent by God. That Jesus is the Saviour of the world. You've got to believe in his name. That's what you've got to believe about Jesus. And that will be enough. And if you believe in Jesus, what does it mean? What does John tell us believing in Jesus means? Well, I've just read what it means there in John 3, 16. It means you have everlasting life. It also means that you're a child of God. You're not condemned. Those who believe in me are not condemned. You now have eternal life. Those who believe in me will never hunger. They will never thirst, not literally, but symbolically and spiritually. Those who believe in me will live. Those who believe in me will never die. Those who believe in me, the Father loves you. Because you believe in Jesus, God the Father loves you. If you believe in Jesus, John 12, 46 tells us, you've come out of the darkness into the light. And you know what? Those who believe in Jesus do his work. That's the challenge. It's wonderful to accept and to understand that believing in Jesus as the Christ, as the Son of God, as the Saviour of the world, is enough to give you salvation, to give you eternal life, to bring you from that lightness into darkness. But because of that, those who believe in me do my work. 
and take his gospel out to other places and live lives that are a glory to him. This royal official had his meeting with Jesus. And from this I think we can see that coming to Jesus, it's just not enough. Even interacting with Jesus, it's just not enough. These things are good, but they are not enough. And what is enough is you have to believe in Jesus. And then you'll get the blessings that he and God will give you. So that's what the royal official did when he met with Jesus. And may it be our our experience as well, as we come to Jesus and interact with Jesus, that more than that, we'll come to believe in Jesus.